Hi, and welcome to Mendoza Dialogues. I'm Peter Ashley, the Director of Marketing and Communications for Mendoza, and I'm pleased to be hosting today's show. Our topic for today is both fascinating and timely. Recently, the U.S. commemorated the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. As we know, it devastated the Gulf Coast, particularly pummeling the city of New Orleans. We're going to be looking at that issue from the perspective of leadership and ethics. We've got great guests to talk about that. One was the executive responsible for getting the lights on for many of the residents in New Orleans, and the second is one of our faculty members who focuses his research on leadership and ethics. Let me introduce him to you now. Our first guest is Rod West, the Chief Administrative Officer and Executive Vice President at Entergy Corporation, where he also served as Chief Executive Officer from 2007 to 2010. Rod is a 1990 graduate of Notre Dame, played football under Lou Holtz, and has been a trustee since 2009. Thanks, Rod, for being here. Thank you. Also, we have Joe Holt, uh, an Associate Professional Specialist at Mendoza since 2004. Uh, Joe teaches Foundations of Ethical Business Conduct, Ethics in the Emerging Markets, among other courses. You also teach uh, and design programs for Mendoza's Custom and Open Executive Group uh, on Ethics, Leadership, Spirituality, and Negotiations. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Uh, before we get into the specific topic, I wanted to give you each a couple of minutes just to tell us a little bit more about your story and how you got to where you are, and I'll start with Rod. Well, great. Uh, as you may note of, I'm a proud 1990 graduate, College of Arts and Letters. Um, I went to uh, attended law school at Tulane University right after graduation and went to work in a, a corporate law firm in uh, New Orleans. And uh, this company called Entergy Corporation uh, in 2009 asked me to consider uh, leaving the practice of law and uh, coming to the business unit. And I'd had some experience in the regulatory arena for utilities, and so it seemed like a natural fit. As I progressed, there were people at the company who were uh, in the hierarchy of the or, uh, organizational structure who suggested that I, I might have the range if I was willing to take a chance at uh, doing something that I had uh, not had any history of doing. Uh, while I was attending the executive MBA program from 2003, um, as a developmental assignment, I was assigned to head up the Electric Distribution Operations Division hmm. uh, for then Entergy New Orleans, uh, one of the subsidiaries. And I graduated from the MBA program on August 13th of 2005, oh. two weeks before <laughs> Katrina hit. And I was two years into this developmental assignment learning uh, the electric operations business. Hmm. And so if you want to talk about uh, the nuance of, uh, and the significance of on-the-job training, right. I can write a book. And timing. Great, thanks. And Joe, how, about, how, how did you uh, get to Notre Dame? Uh, What's your well, process? My path did not involve uh, membership on a national championship football team. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> but it's been a long <laughs> time. <laughs> no, well, it's all right. The, the glory still radiates. But, um, I actually graduated from Boston College, an undergrad, uh, spent 12 years as a Jesuit and uh, studied in philosophy and theology, has studied Hebrew and Christian scripture over, over in Rome. As a Jesuit, I had taught business ethics for, uh, for years, just because uh, a lot of my own classmates were, were people in business, and they're very good people who got involved in sometimes so, some gray issues, and then I thought that a, a lifetime devoted to helping good people think through tough problems would be um, worthwhile. Um, what I found was that when I spoke to people in law or business, I got a very polite hearing, but there'd always be a little smile that would say, uh, a nice idea, but you have no idea what it's like in the trenches. So after leaving the Jesuits in the early 90s, um, I went to law school as well, and also worked with a corporate attorney in, in uh, Chicago uh, law firms while teaching business ethics and a spirituality of work in Loyola University of Chicago's uh, evening MBA program. And uh, so I did that for about five, six years, and then I directed a clinic on entrepreneurship at the University of Chicago, where the law and business students and I would help low-income inner-city entrepreneurs get financially self-sufficient by starting up and growing um, businesses. And um, then I came to Notre Dame in 2004. It was a place where I could kind of put everything that I cared about um, together. Great, great. Well, the, the perfect uh, two people to be talking about this. So. Thinking about Katrina, I wanted to, to ask Rod a question. Um, obviously, an energy company prepares for these kinds of things, these kinds of events. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how Ener energy prepares for hurricanes and if there's anything special done given with the anticipated size of Katrina. I think uh, the, the notion of preparing for hurricanes and being prepared <laughs> for Katrina are two distinct uh, things. Mm -hmm. 
Part of the, the utility ethos is a culture of, of preparation and drills. And so every year, we would drill a, a tabletop drill, uh, a binder, and, and you turn the page and, and you'd read what the scenario would be. And it was all around inculcating this culture of preparedness. Ironically, on, in 2005, uh, hurricane season is usually from uh, June to, uh, to about November. In April, we, we, we take part in the drill. The scenario in the April 2005 drill for Entergy was the bowl filling up. That is, the, the levees did not break, mm -hmm. they were overtopped by mm -hmm. rising water, whether it was the river, the Mississippi River to the south or Lake Pontchartrain to the north of the city. And the scenario described six to eight feet of water. And as you turn the page, unthinkable. It, it, the unthinkable, <laughs> as you turn the page and I'm reading the scenario, it's a, it's a, a conference call at the time, uh, I'm not going to repeat for public consumption what my initial reaction was, and actually I, I said it, <laughs> but it was, are you kidding me? The gist was, are you kidding me? If there's six to eight feet of water, there is no scenario where we're talking about how we're going to restore power or, re or bring the grid back. This is a conversation around safety. So mm -hmm. my thinking is, um, mm -hmm. I'm totally focused on how do I get our people out of harm's way. Well, of course, that was the point of the drill. Mm -hmm. And so Katrina became uh, a drill scenario early on, almost tongue in cheek, because we'd had so much practice with the, the litany of storms that, that threaten the Gulf Coast every year. What, what turned Katrina from a, a traditional storm recovery scenario to a catastrophic scenario was when the levees began to give way. Mm -hmm. they, they were compromised from the bottom and the bowl didn't just fill up with, with the expected areas of the low-lying areas that you would expect floods. You had 80% of the city's land mass underwater. And the scenario changed uh, in the process of about 12 to 18 hours where we realized uh, that we were dealing with a, with a catastrophe. But the drilling uh, process, uh, really focusing first on sort of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. yeah. that was, if, if there was a theme for, uh, for how we responded uh, then, how we respond now, and sort of our prioritization in, in the face of that crisis. I think the, the hierarchy of needs from both a human and a corporate perspective will give you some insight into how we approach managing during, during a crisis. And Katrina and mm -hmm. subsequent storms uh, and subs subsequent um, uh, calamities, whether they be cyber or otherwise, we're all simil similar dynamics of, uh, of how we go about responding when literally and figuratively the lights go out. I will follow up on that and around decision making. I know if uh, leadership is, a lot of it is about making decisions. And I know that making a decision when it's calm is different sometimes from making a decision when it's a crisis. How did decision making uh, change or did it change uh, during Katrina, and then um, I'll want Joe's thoughts on kind of that general question around leadership in general. You know, you made reference to my, my background at Notre Dame with, with Coach Holtz, and, and he had this concept uh, called uh, the WIN, W-I-N, and it stood for what's important now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I, th I thought about that during the literal dark days of Katrina, where I, I felt like I was I was in uh, this, this drama that the rest of the world was seeing, but also had some objective distance to try and keep focused on what's important now. And the decision making really was focused on people. We knew that at the end of the day, we had to restore a, a, an electric grid that, wound, that would wind up being one of the major factors of repopulation and production for the region. Mm -hmm. We knew that before the storm hit. But we knew that bucket trucks and wires uh, didn't bring power back. It was the people mm -hmm. who manipulated that machinery that brought the people back. And so Katrina, from its inception, when the gravity of the devastation hit, it was really about reclaiming a reclamation project for people. Uh, it wasn't until we were able to uh, restore the psyche of those hundreds of employees who I had to inform uh, that they were homeless it was, it was only after we were able to get them off of their back and on their feet that we could then ask them to focus on the mechanical aspects of, of bringing uh, the power back on. And so uh, 10 years gives you perspective. 
And, and I can tell you, as I think about the worst of, of decision making uh, in, in and after Katrina, it was around the human impact of decisions and how we would go about motivating individuals to, to work on their craft without knowing uh, how their families were going to pick up uh, the pieces. And I'll also add, uh, particularly for those students who aspire to, be, to great um, levels of success financially or in organizational structures, there is a big distinction between the authority that comes with a, uh, being appointed to a position and the responsibility that comes with it. And, and never was that lesson more pronounced for me uh, mm. than, than when, uh, when Katrina rendered my workforce homeless. Mm. And I knew that every decision that, that I and that we as a leadership team would make was affecting the lives not just of the citizens of New Orleans, but the employees who we were going to be relying on uh, to bring the city back. Mm. And Joe, in terms of that, from your studies across companies, yeah. is, this, is that a similar type of reaction around decision making and around prioritization and leadership? Yeah, I, I think that's right, and, and you know, Rod has emphasized uh, training, and that's obviously uh, critical. I, I think another thing that, that a lot of the best uh, leaders and commentators um, include is uh, prior training, but also prior reflection, the capacity for, for solitude, kind of really just knowing who you are and what your values and, and principles and, and so forth um, is, because you know, when the crisis hits. Um, you need to be not only in a leadership position, but actually a leader. That's right. I mean, you need to have the trust and confidence of, of your people um, ahead of time, and, and you need to have thought through uh, what you're going to do and, and what your priorities are. Um, one uh, commentator on it said, said that if you wait until your first crisis to figure all that out, it's like being a soldier who waits until his first firefight to figure <laughs> out how to use his weapon. So you kind of you got to know what you're doing That's right. um, before, before that time comes. So what are some behaviors uh, that m make leaders successful in crisis situations that, that you've seen universally, uh, and then how they play out in, in this situation with Rod? Well, one, I mean, you know, if you're a leader, you're asking people to, to follow you and, and to follow you willingly, not just because they have to, but right. because they want to, mm -hmm. they have to see something in you that they believe in. And that's partly where you are leading them, kind of a vision, yeah. um, a, a vision that they can all share and be inspired by, but also who is leading them. Um, I, I think they need to see a couple of things in particular. They need to see that you're caring uh, that you give a damn about them and about the people that you all jointly serve. And they also need to see that you're competent. Because you could have the heart of Francis of Assisi and, and you know, mean all the good in the world, but you're actually, unless you're actually like good at your stuff, right. you know, that, that's not going to get it done either. And then there are folks who are competent but who don't have the caring part. So they need to see yeah. both of those things um, together. I think, you know, sadly, in response to Katrina, we, when leadership is criticized, federal government and, and state and local levels, uh, one or both of those things <laughs> seem to be yeah. lacking. You know, we, 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 was, the, was the response caring and, and was it um, competent? And, and there are just a whole variety of ways. You know, caring, I think, in this kind of scenario a, at the federal level is kind of um, getting critical resources mm -hmm. to a hit and vulnerable community in, in a timely kind of fashion. Hmm. So it was that done, I, I think it was kind of a failure there. So I think the best leaders um, already have the trust and confidence of their people. Uh, they're caring, they're competent. I think they face reality um, with eyes wide open, but without panic. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't do anybody a favor if you downplay the gravity of right. the risk that you're If you're facing. the one panicking, you're, the team's really in trouble. That's I think right. that's right. Yeah. I, I think they also, you know, while being uh, the leader, don't take the whole world on their own shoulders. Because I think in a crisis situation, you need the best from your people, um, including, you know, their insights, their ideas, all of that. So I think the best leaders um, believe in themselves. They also believe in their people mm -hmm. and, and kind of seek their contribution to, to helping things out um, mm -hmm. as well. And they have kind of a strategic plan about how to go about responding to. Okay. Those employees, um, 
It's interesting. You're you're sounding uh, like a Notre Dame man. I know that that Boston College must be rubbing <laughs> what off. What a coincidence! I've been, um, I've been <laughs> here twelve years. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I'm wearing today the the ring from the 1988 national championship team, and the motto of that team was trust, love, and commitment. Mm -hmm. And and Lou Holtz told us when when we we were student student athletes, and and I still use it today in in teaching. Uh, that that I asked and people ask three questions of you before they make a decision as to whether you're going to be a viable partner, leader, comrade uh, in the foxhole. Can I trust you? Do you genuinely care about me and others? And, and are you committed? And, and I, I ask those same three questions to people who I depend on day in and day out, both at home and, and, and in the work environment. But I also believe that each of the employees ask that question of us as, as leaders. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it goes directly to the heart of what Joe just mentioned. And, and by the time the crisis hits, if they can't answer those three questions in the affirmative, mm -hmm. you got no shot at leading them. Mm -hmm. they'll, right. they'll move because it's in their enlightened best interest to do so if they see it as such. Right. But they're not going to go into the darkness of the unknown and, right. and embrace uncertainty unless they have a point of view around you as the leader. And you have mm -hmm. to establish that long before the crisis hits. Right. right. In some instances, the crisis may be so new in your career that you, you don't have the chance, but there has to be some foundation upon which you get at the minimum the benefit of the doubt. Right. In the time, by the time Katrina hit, one of the great blessings for me relative to that group was that I had established enough of a rapport as a leader that long before they knew um, or, or cared about how much I knew, they knew about how much I cared. And as a result, when I told them they were homeless, the, I, I, we did the only thing that we could do together and that was cry. That's all, that's all we could do and it was the appropriate thing because it was all we could do. Mm -hmm. But when we wiped away our, our tears, both my mind and my heart, and as well as theirs, turned to, okay, mm. what's important now? Right. Mm. And, and that, that mindset um, is far beyond sort of academic or athletic rah-rah. It's the cornerstone of leadership, of, of human motivation, of, of team dynamics. And it matters uh, what you do and how you engage people day in and day out because they're paying attention uh, to everything you're doing. And, and as you said, I think appropriately so, the crisis is not the time to decide mm. you're going to be a leader. So yeah. I want to follow up on what you said uh, a couple of times. You mentioned the, the employees and how to motivate them. And I wanted to, it seems like it'd be very challenging if you, your job is to help get the lights on, but your house may have been destroyed. Right. You know? And you talked about a little bit about the, the process of doing that, but elaborate specifically, if you could, on how you motivate them uh, to, even though they've, the, they've cried and they're acknowledging the, the pain they're going through, they still have to turn and focus on the work at hand, but it's still there. So any, I want to hear your thoughts on that from your ex experience. And then Joe, I wanted you to look at that from a perspective of, are there any ethical considerations with pulling people away, maybe potentially from their families to work right. because their work is so critical and just that whole dynamic? Right. You know, all of us, um, regardless of our chosen profession or craft, when we, we get up in the morning, th again, this goes to Maslow's, uh, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we want the work that we do to be relevant, to be impactful in some way, shape, mm -hmm. or form. The men and women who are in the, that business of, of managing that electric grid, they know and are motivated by the fact that absent power and their ability to restore power, communities don't get back on their feet. Mm. And so it was almost like a cause, a calling, if you mm -hmm. will. Mm -hmm. We knew when the lights were out, it was our job to get it back on. We knew if we didn't somehow restore that power, that the community, the lifestyle, the way of life, we're done. That we, we, we were done. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I appeal to their sense of higher calling and or purpose, um, which was part of their training, mind you. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, again, a rah-rah speech. I appeal to the fact that this is our responsibility and, mm -hmm. and that people who don't know us, who could probably care less about us right about now, are absolutely depending on us. And so mm -hmm. once I got 
beyond that basic need of how am I going to survive and, 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 and deal, how's my family going to survive? I could, I could more easily, I think, turn their attention to the fundamentals of our craft, of what it is we do for a living. Ten years later, I can make it sound a lot easier than it was, because let's be clear, not everybody made it, mm -hmm. psychologically and, and or physically, but the lion's share of people accepted the challenge because we had trained them to understand the significance of the role for the greater good mm. and the significance of their contribution to the team's success. And that goes to the point we were making uh, earlier that you don't wait until the crisis to drill the fundamentals. Mm. And that's where uh, football, um, certainly uh, decision-making, uh, ethics, my, my legal training, all came into being because my role wasn't to be an engineer in power systems. Mm -hmm. My toughest job was motivating people whose job it was to do that, mm -hmm. to, to pursue their, their craft and, and training in the, in the face of, of uncertainty and to make the right decisions along the way, mm -hmm. both in terms of immediacy and, and prioritization that, that was for the greater good. And mm -hmm. that, let me tell you, there is no training for that. You, can, you, you, you want some fundamentals. It's like raising a, a child. You want to give your child the fundamentals to make good decisions, but you can't make the decisions for them, right? Right. Yeah. right. Ethical thought, thoughts? Oh, well, that's inspiring. <laughs> uh, I'm listening to you, Rod. I'm reminded of a, a quote from an ancient Roman Cato, a statesman, who said that uh, Cicero spoke and people marveled. Uh, Caesar spoke and people marched. <laughs> so <laughs> how do you speak to people in a way that they want to just say, oh, that's very nice sounding, yeah, right. that they actually want to march? That's right. <laughs> you know, they that's they right. want to do something. Be because, you know, we, we, we'll all do what we need to do to keep our jobs, but then there's that discretion vary, citizenship yeah, behavior, the things point. you may or may not do depending on who's asking you and how they're asking you. So how do you get people to go that extra mile or Katrina more than a mile um, for you? So Ron talked about, you know, tapping into this sense of, of calling of higher purpose. And, and I think that's, that's great because most people, uh, you know, work b because they, they need to, to work. Um, you know, they pay their bills and so forth. Um, but I think most people also have a strain of idealism. Most people like to feel good about the work that they are devoting so much of their time and talent and energy to. So they want to find some sense of kind of meaning and fulfillment. And you talked about them having a duty to yeah. do that work, but a unique duty. That's right. I mean, there was nobody else to do it. That's right. And my understanding no, is no, that without the power, right. the that's pumps weren't going to work? Nothing. And pumps, water's buildings, water, uh, sewer. Um, all of the factors of repopulation that, that we take for granted when we're moving, you're moving from uh, the Boston area to South Bend, you don't think for a second about running water, sewer, schools, right. grocery stores. Take it for granted. Take it for granted. Mm -hmm. yeah. All of those, those fundamental um, landmarks, milestones for community were gone. Yeah. And, and we knew that unless we were able to get that fundamental resource, the electricity up and running, all the, all the factors of repopulation wouldn't exist and New Orleans would be left literally for dead. Because you're in the bottom of the hierarchy. Right? You got it. And you got to move up, but you, you can't move up until you've so settled the bottom. We, we use the analogy called the gumbo analogy. And in, in the Midwest, I guess it would be stew. But, but in a gumbo, the first thing you do, the base ingredients of a gumbo is the roux, the brown sauce that, that, mm. that makes the soup. And we knew that we were the roux for the gumbo that would be the repopulation and resurgence mm. uh, of New Orleans. And, and we also knew that if we didn't do it in a timely manner, mm. that Maslow's hierarchy of needs would force people to go elsewhere sure. and repopulate elsewhere. Which and the, they thus have. the <laughs> likelihood, the more time it took, the likelihood of people coming back to New Orleans uh, would, would, would wane. Mm. And so we, we kind of we felt, like, felt like it was on us if New Orleans was going to be rebuilt. Um, right. And trust me, there's no, no higher calling than, than this enlightened sense of, of mission, uh, really, yeah, right? Yeah, this, this calling.
You know, in that sense of, of calling, there's a, we talk about the importance of freedom all the time, but there's an important difference between negative freedom, which is kind of freedom from the absence of external constraints. I don't live under radical rule. I can do what I want to do, say what I want to say. Um, you know, and, and that's necessary and important, and billions of people in the world don't have it, and, and, and we're yearning for it. But then beyond that, there's a notion of positive freedom, which is freedom for. So given that I could do whatever I want to do with my life and for my work, et cetera, what is worth devoting myself to? And I think a challenge of values-based leadership is to tap into the positive freedom of That's your right. employees, to give them a reason to want to get out of bed on Monday morning beyond the fact that they need to, yeah. um, to get the paycheck. Joe, you're so right. Uh, we had employees who we literally in boats picked off of rooftops who were stranded after the storm on their roofs. And we found out because they were they were they had the last bit of juice in their battery to power the radio to let us know where, where they were. Hmm. And to your point, when we picked them off the roof and we're trying to get them to safety, the only thing they were thinking about was rejoining the crews to help restore hmm. the power. And this was even before the water went down hmm. where we could safely operate. We were in rescue mode because again, the water didn't go down for, for several days. And there was no restoration as long as the water was there. And I remember marveling at the motivation, you know, because some people died on, on those mm -hmm. roofs, but, we, but our employees, that's, that's where I sort of tapped into this notion of this higher purpose or calling, was that these folks, either there was something that clicked where they, in order for their coping mechanism, was to tap into that higher calling so that they would not either be overcome or distracted by the gravity of the catastrophe. Right. Mm -hmm. And I guess there was a part of it that was cathartic that because this purpose uh, was a reason to kind of rise above your own circumstance, it wound up being a survival uh, tactic um, by default right. or, or, or by design uh, mm -hmm. to, to, manage, to manage through. And I, I often thought about what it must have been like uh, for folks coming back from the military, for instance. Mm -hmm. For those of us who went through it, um, you know, we look at each other and no explanation is necessary. Right. For those who haven't, sometimes no explanation would ever suffice. Right. And, right. Uh, but I, I think about that when, when, you, when, you, when you speak about tapping, tapping into that, that higher purpose when managing through a crisis, because it is far from a blue sky environment and all the rules that we expect, uh, the rules of, uh, of hierarchy and command and control and, and, and a rules base, a compliance base ethos of normal leadership environment. Right. You gotta go to the other playbook when the real bullets are flying. Hmm. Yeah, there's a leadership guru at um, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, Ronald Heifetz and his team, and they talk about the notion of adaptive leadership based on this distinction right. between a technical challenge, which is one that you can solve by using existing personnel and ways of doing business yeah. and, and so forth, like uh, you know how to make a car more fuel efficient, technical yeah. challenge. Mm -hmm. Adaptive challenge is one that's so far reaching that you gotta throw out the old playbook. Yep that it requires a different personnel or a different way of thinking or, or you know, a uh, different way of, 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 doing, of doing things. And, and that requires kind of th this notion of, of thinking outside the box mm. and kind of uh, believing in, in your people and, and all that. And it sounds clearly what you were facing was, was an Look adaptive um, challenge. In business right now, I mean, the newspaper industry is facing an adaptive challenge. People aren't buying the papers anymore. You know, Kodak, when things went digital, faced an adaptive um, challenge. Blockbuster faced an adaptive challenge after Netflix came along. So how do you lead people in a way that they're committed, which clearly you had, had done, because they don't become committed the moment they find themselves right. on a roof. Right. You had, a, had done some important leadership work before that. Uh, committed, but also kind of... Uh, adaptable. Mm. And, and, and in current business uh, environment today, the, the one risk that cuts across uh, industries uh, and organizational seems is cyber risk. Mm. Oh. You know, and, and all of our businesses are, are trying to figure out how do we adapt to this ex existential threat right. that, is, that, is, that is cyber. And uh, I, I just returned from a visit to Australia where, where they deal with hurricanes, cyclones as they call them, in the same sense that we do here. And we, we were talking about it. it. It matters not 
whether it's a hurricane, whether it's drought or fire, or whether it's cyber, risk is risk and loss is loss in terms of how you manage uh, during a crisis. Because the very lessons of Katrina uh, that we were able to bring uh, apply in, in both cyber uh, circumstances, fire and what have you. And it's, it's managing through that uncertainty. But it, your North Star has to be your raison d'etre as, as a right. firm, as a right. company, as a group, as an institution. Why are we here? Why are you here? And, and that becomes the bottom of, of Maslow's uh, hierarchy pyramid uh, for, for your, your company, for your family, for your city, for your region. And, and building upon that sort of sets the priority uh, around which you make and by which you make decisions wrapped around this halo I think it's appropriate word, halo of, 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 of ethics. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You, you mentioned that not everyone made it, uh, obviously some people died, but also the psychological That's aspect right. of not making it. So in terms of employees, this idea of, you know, there's crises and there's crises, right? And I think what's interesting is when you have a crisis that's truly a crisis, it probably puts a lot of the other ones that people say are crises into perspective. No doubt. Uh, but for this one, for the employees, trying to return to the day-to-day -day operation uh, trying to get back to normal, trying to, whatever that normal might be. New uh, normal. That's right. <laughs> and, and, it's, and you mentioned a great uh, analogy with the, with the veterans returning. That's so right. some people could do it, make the transition, right? And yes. others probably said, I can't take this anymore. That's right. So talk a little about how that played out for Entergy and then also in corporate cultures in general. It, 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 it was and still is for me uh, heartbreaking because when I, when I told the team early on, not everybody's going to make it through. I was thinking about it through the lens of I know this is tough and I don't have an expectation that everybody's going to want to take this journey that I knew we were about to, to go on. But adversity you know, reveals, brings out the best and worst mm -hmm. in, in people. And the best that we could do to satisfy our ethical obligation to the employees who in, entrusted us with their lives and, and put themselves at risk was to provide help. But but for the hundreds of employees and ultimately thousands of employees, everybody came to that crisis uh, with a different set of, of bricks in their wheelbarrow, mm. depending upon their personal circumstances. And, and none of us could know or predict the tipping point. Mm. And I think we were able to discharge our duty by recognizing in advance that people were going to need help, both during and after, provide the best support that we could. But for some, it was just too much. Um, and, and again, 10 years provides perspective. And, and I can tell you, the toughest part for me, even as, as a leader, because I was part of a team of people, some of whom were above me, who, who, had, who was my halo, if you will, <laughs> there was a part of me that wondered if I would make it through, because the, the adrenaline of the moment carried me and allowed me to maintain this objectivity that was my coping mechanism. I, you know, to the point we made earlier, I knew they couldn't see me come unraveled and so I was trying to hold on mm -hmm. to the rope. I never worried about my family. My family was out of harm's way. But my family, if they were sitting here with this Joe, they, my wife would tell you that she wondered whether she had lost me mm -hmm. to, to uh, PT, uh, PTSD, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Because when I came down from, uh, I, I literally was in in command mode for months, and they were away from me. But when I came down from the immediacy of the life-threatening, society-threatening aspect of Katrina, and we began <clears throat> to to put the building blocks of of a return to the new normal, mm -hmm. they weren't sure whether I could come out of it. A long time to decompress from no that. No question. Yeah. No question about it. And so, you know, we, we can talk from the position of leadership, mm -hmm. but trust me, not, not even leaders are immune uh, from the, un the uncertainties of, of managing through prolonged uh, stress. Uh, it, it took its toll. And, and I can now talk to you about the significance of maintaining a North Star. Right. And, uh, and for me, that North Star was obviously faith in and, and family, uh, you know, but it was also that, that higher calling that, that kept me grounded. Mm. But, uh, but there, were, there were employees for whom this was 
too much. This was too much. Joe, is that what yeah. you find in your research? That this is consistent across companies and cultures? Yeah, we, we, one of the traits that, that Rod just, just eloquently um, touched on that it's really critical for leaders in general and especially in crises is uh, humility. Mm. You know, nowadays, humility is a concept that's undergone a change in meaning over the centuries. Nowadays, when we say somebody's humble, we think they mean they have an acute awareness of their shortcomings, limitations, oh no, I'm not, I'm not this, I'm not that. The original meaning is from the same Latin root as humus, the earth, and it's being in touch with reality. So it's kind of, mm. um, it's knowing your shortcomings, limitations, but it's also knowing your strengths. Um, and I think leadership requires both, because if you don't know your strengths, that then you won't have the confidence that That's you right. need to inspire trust um, in others. But if you don't know shortcomings and limitations, like recognition, I wasn't sure I would make right. it. Right. <laughs> you know, then you don't appear quite, quite as human That's as right. people. And then you don't recognize the extent to which you need other people. And that's, that's other people right. and your team, but it's that's also, right. you mentioned the importance of your faith yeah. and your family. So, yeah. you know, God and, and your family. Whatever and that rope is that you're holding Whatever it is, yeah. um, you know, what you are going to need to do to take care of yourself. Because that's, right. that's something you do for yourself, but you do it for the people you lead, you do it for your, your family, and you do it for the community that you, that you and your team all serve as well. But uh, if you lack humility, you, you don't do that, and then I think you're less likely to make it. Interesting, really. Interestingly enough, during the literal dark days. And this was when communication was beginning to fade because at the time, 10 years ago, we, we were just discovering text messages or, right. or Blackberry pens. Right. But it was the Notre Dame community. It was Chuck Lennon, uh, the Alumni Association. It was Coach Holtz and some of my teammates who were fighting valiantly to find out how I was doing and to offer their, their help and support that was an affirmation for me of the lessons that I'd learned on this campus uh, as a student and as an, as an athlete. And, and I will tell you, I've told the story many times about how affirming it was for me uh, being a part of this place where that, that, that ethos, that, that mm -hmm. ethic um, uh, that was grounded in sort of God, country, Notre Dame, you know, we see it as a tagline, mm -hmm. but but in the darkest of the dark days, when I wasn't too sure how, how the day was going to play out, mm -hmm. it was very affirming for me to know that there were people who, um, who were looking out for me, who were caring mm -hmm. for me, where um, they were part of the rope that I held on to when I wasn't too sure about the, and this, this, There was no false bravado. All of that had been stripped. And, and any man our woman would have been tested in this environment. Mm -hmm. And so right. um, my, my sense of humility is, is overtaken only by my sense of gratitude that I did come out of it. Because mm. yeah. uh, I'm, I'm here standing because of the people who, who were supportive of me uh, uh, throughout, uh, not solely because of anything great I did as a leader. I was thrust into that environment. And I thank God that I had exhibited enough to give those folks who I depended upon mm. um, some faith that, that they could trust me knowing I cared and, and, and that I was committed to them and, and to getting this job done. Yeah. Or, oh, go ahead, yeah. Well, uh, something that Rod touched on, a sense of you know, the Notre Dame uh, family, yeah. community kind of coming there, um, touches on, I think, a really important ideal. Um, one of the principles of Catholic social teaching is uh, solidarity. And solidarity is a sense of being part of one human family. Yeah and kind of, you know, caring about each other. And, you know, what do you learn? How do you learn what that means? Most of us learn it at home, and then you learn it in a place like this. We have a community that kind of goes beyond home where people really do kind of come together and support each other, and yeah. even, even years later. I think the challenge for, for leaders and for all of us is how do you extend that? That's right. Um, mm -hmm. Beyond Notre how do you extend it to all of New Orleans? How do you extend it to all of the United States? Where, where people genuinely feel that they belong the to the universal character of our, of our faith. How do, you, how, do, how do you manifest the universality mm -hmm. of the church? I mean, mm -hmm. the Christians, you pray, pray, pray the Our Father, and I sometimes, when I'm praying that, find myself saying, can I really pray that if I don't think of other people as my brothers and sisters? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah. to the extent I don't, then uh, That's right. you know, it's not my father, it's our father. So That's how right. do you kind of, how right. do you extend that uh, that you've experienced here, kind of that broader mm. kind of... Uh, first first by example. Mm. Right. And before we run out of time, I want to give you each a chance to have any last thoughts or final advice um, for an aspiring leader in terms of maybe 
things to think about, preparation, anything that just you want to make sure we share before we wrap up? I would, particularly for uh, aspiring leaders who are currently students, the only thing, the best thing that you offer uh, to a, a prospective partner or, or, or employer coming out of the University of Notre Dame is a, an ethics and a faith-based faith orientation and a demonstrated ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Mm -hmm. And the leaders who are going to thrive in, uh, in the face of adversity today, tomorrow, are no different than the ones yesterday. And those who embrace this notion of, of life is what happens to us while we're making other plans. <laughs> and your willingness to embrace um, change and uncertainty, what winds up being a calling card mm -hmm. uh, for how you live your life, how you lead. Because the only thing that is constant, and, and I'm now 25 years out of Notre Dame, the only thing that's been constant in those 25 years in my professional life has been change and how adaptive uh, have I been? And not from a, how adaptive from a success or failure perspective, but how adaptive from a mindset. Mm. And so for me, my parting message uh, to the student um, body here is that you're, you're, you're being taught uh, very significant building blocks uh, that will be tools for decision making in the future. But embrace the change. Mm. Uh, don't, don't fear it, you're, you're, you're more than prepared uh, to deal with it. Thanks. Joe. Um, I guess if I had a message for aspiring leaders, it would be, uh, it's not all about you. It's about the people you serve Just as a most leader, and it's about right. the folks that's that, right. that, that you, you serve um, on, on, a lot, on a lot of levels. Amen. Right. Um, in an interview last year, I was asked, is, is there a book that you would recommend that all folks in business school read? And I'd recommended um, a book by a psychologist, Edward D.C., on why we do what we do. Mm. It's a brilliant little wisdom book on, on the notion of, of motivation. And you're saying, usually when you think of motivation, we think of it as something that one person does for other people. So the motivational speaker, Coach Holtz in the locker room sure. beforehand, um, you know, all of that. And he said, you know, and that's there, and that does a certain amount of good. But, but he said, a truer and deeper understanding of motivation involves creating conditions under which your people will be self-motivated. Because uh, mm. um, that, that is the Brilliant. gift that keeps on giving, mm, you know. Uh, I was a Jesuit for 12 years, and, and the Jesuit way of measuring success in work is to ask the question whether you have rendered yourself superfluous. Mm -hmm. If things go well only when you're standing there right at the center of things and things fall apart when you're not, then you haven't done a very good job yeah. mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, good developing stuff. your people yeah, and, and equipping, right. equipping them. Great. So so believe in yourself, but also believe in your people mm -hmm. and, uh, and help them kind of develop their potential and then uh, stay out of the way. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for the great conversation. I appreciate your time. That's all the time we have for today's broadcast. If you'd like to watch more episodes of Mendoza Dialogues, or learn more about our programs and thought leadership, please visit us at mendoza.nd.edu. Thanks for watching and have a great day.